Hare Krishna Madhavantru. Welcome once again to the Monks Podcast. It's wonderful to have you again. Thank you for letting me be here and get your association. Oh, it's I who relish your association and so many other devotees also have appreciated the breadth of the discussions that we have. So I was thinking today we could discuss about uh, the issue of when devotees face difficulties in the sense of say failures, then how to deal with it without blaming. Now, often we talk about not blaming others, but there is also the aspect of not blaming oneself and beating oneself down. Mm -hmm. So what would be the, what would be a devotional way of dealing with failure? I once saw a Christian article where on failures in spiritual life. They had a nice title, how to fail well. So, how to fail well. So even if you have to fail. So broadly, I've seen that uh, for devotees, I, okay, let me start it this way that, you know, most people, when they present spirituality in the outside the devotional context, often spirituality is presented in a very affirmative way of by which people can feel good, feel confident, feel positive that you, know, you are indestructible, you are a precious child of God, you are loved by God. And that way, even from a spiritual sense, people feel positive about spirituality. And then that positivity helps them to face life's challenges. But what I have seen uh, in our devotional life, quite often we don't talk so much about the difficulties of life and facing life's challenges. In fact, he said that his life is material, it's full of misery, and it's still somewhat dismissive about life challenges. And instead, we have our own spiritual practices, which can be quite demanding. And then, so instead of bhakti equipping a person to face life challenges, bhakti becomes like one more challenge in a challenging life. Oh, I have to wake up in the morning, I have to do this sadhana. And then if somebody is facing, say, difficulties or failures in their life, and on top of them, top of it, they're also struggling in their spiritual life. So then what happens? That becomes an additional source of failure and negativity. So sometimes, at least what I have talked with devotees is that they sometimes feel that bhakti practice seems to increase my problems. So... I feel that this is a very negative approach to bhakti or at least a negative presentation of bhakti which they may have got. But any thoughts on this direction? Yeah, I, I, it's something we, we talked a little before. I, I call the blame game. Yes. And, and that is that when the symptom of not being able to deal with my failure is I blame it on someone else. Hmm. And, and that blame can be very subtle or it can be very gross. I blame it on my wife that, that I would be able to get up in the morning and do, but she was talking too much last night or I blame it on the temple president or I blame it on the institution. And in other subtle ways, it's there too. We, as you pointed out, we, uh, this is an integral part of our philosophy that we should see the Krishna Saiva Karna Karna, he's a controller of everything. But when we're pushed up against the wall, when we're put in a situation that we, we're not in control of and things don't go the way we want, how do we react then? We should look at, do we look for some kind of conspiracy theory? That all the, there's some group behind this thing, there's some vast conspiracy behind this, or, or do we look to see it's my fault? And it's a really interesting thing to me, if you look in, in Vedic literature, speaking about conspiracy theories, uh, first of all, th there's, a, there's one example of a group of people who basically had no conspiracy theories, and that's the bridge bossies. And although so many demons were coming, and, and demons coming in the guise of a beautiful woman, her name is Putana, and Rohini and Mother Yashoda are so guileless and so simple. Yes, you can go in and offer your breast to our baby, no problem. Vatsasura, they, they have faith in Vatsasura, the, the cowherd boys. They, they, Palumbasura, they thought really it's Krishna's friend. Shankachuda, Rupa Goswami says that even Brindadevi, 
thought that he was coming. It was a sun god coming to worship Radharani. They're simple. There's, they, they just depend on Krishna. They're so absorbed in thinking of Krishna. For them, there's no conspiracy theories. There's no blame game on anybody else. But we do find in Vedic literature uh, a number of persons who do who do uh, ascribe to conspiracy theories. And three such personalities that come to my mind are Ravan, Kanksa, and Venu. And Kanksa thought, everybody's against me, and I have to do something with all the members of the Yadu dynasty because they're all conspiring against me. And he was completely paranoid. And Ravan thought his own brother was against him. And Venu also thought, everybody's against me. The Brahmins are against me. And I have to stop everybody. So conspiracy theories... And it is part of the blame game. It's, it, it, it means we've not actually begun our bhakti. And although we may have begun in some external sense, the chanting, attending programs, and doing service, which is very laudable, but if we haven't come to the point of what Lord Brahma describes as tatenu kampam susamikshamana, where, where I accept whatever comes is my own fault, then we haven't really begun bhakti. Because the blame game and, and, the, and the idea of conspiracies is just completely opposite of bhakti. Bhakti means that I see that, that Krishna is doing everything. There's a wonderful story you may have heard of Gorka Shurdas Babaji that once I, I heard he was in Nabadweep town and some little boys started teasing him, making fun of him, and they started throwing stones at him. And Gorka Shurdas Babaji turned around and started yelling at them. But he wasn't exactly yelling at them. He said, Krishna, if you don't stop this right now, I'm going to tell your mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So he didn't see a conspiracy. All, all the residents of Nabadweep are against me. They're, they're, they're putting the kids up to this. He didn't see anything like that. He just completely saw Krishna's hand. And, and for me, that's my job as a devotee. Every day, especially these days, I'm getting emails and things from people saying, oh, there's this conspiracy, there's this thing, there's that, and they're from devotees. And I think to myself, well, okay, maybe that's true, maybe it's not true, but I want to be a Hare Krishna devotee. And what is our philosophy? How, what is our approach of dealing with that? And that's very, very clear. We, we deal with, with bhakti. We take shelter of Krishna, just like the bridge bhasis. Mm. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of striking points. Say, so first, let me understand what you said about. So blame game, when normally we, I might blame person A, person B, but when I expand the blame game, so that practically, like a, there is a whole network out to get us, when we think that, that conspiracy theory is like an expanded version of the blame game. Isn't it? That's what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Now, let me interject real quick too. Sometimes yeah. in ISKCON we say, and there's a conspiracy, and it's the, the, the conservative devotees, they're, they're doing this, or the liberal devotees are doing it. And we put a label on a group of devotees, and we blame them for the problems in the society. Everything would be going okay, but the problem is because these people are not... <laughs> but bhakti means let me be the source of change. Let me give up the attitude that I'm the reformer. I'm okay. sorry for interrupting. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, this is. I once heard a class in my early days. Like, you know, the title was I won't mention the devotee's name. It was the ultimate conspiracy theory. And the that's ultimate, a conspiracy. <laughs> ultimate conspiracy theory, and it was that how Maya Devi is the ultimate conspiracy agent. <laughs> <laughs> and through all the agents, uh, through various sources, temptations are coming upon us and she's attacking us and she's constantly trying to pull us down. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in terms of the metaphor, I was quite intrigued by how the devotee drew out the metaphor. But afterward, I started thinking, as devotees, we don't want uh, to have some kind of paranoia or persecution complex. Right. Yes, there is. There are temptations in the world and we have to be cautious. But we need to be more Krishna conscious than say, temptation conscious. We need to be, have more faith in Krishna than, than fear of Maya. Yes, of course, fear is required. But um, so at a big level, some devotees consider that in some ways that there is one aspect of faith in Krishna 
and some devotees consider that actually skepticism toward the material world is is a sign of their intellectual maturity or their intellectual brilliance mm -hmm. and often those who are conspiracy theorists they actually feel that uh, they are more intelligent than everyone else that you know i am able to see these patterns over here and you can't right. see those patterns so uh, in some ways we could say that uh, in the 18th chapter krishna talks about intelligence in the mode of ignorance where he says that sarvarthan viparitam cha buddhi sa partha tamasi adharmam dharmam iti ya manyate tamasavrata that that intelligence which considers the dharma to be adharma and adharma to be dharma and that ends up seeing everything opposite that is intelligence but it's in the mode of ignorance so in some ways if we are seeing conspiracy theories it could be that we are more conscious of that conspiracy and how it is working rather than how krishna is working mm -hmm. so and the, i mean there are many theories like uh, some of them are like too distasteful to even mention but say some things about you know what happened in our movement after prabhupada departed and then there were some people who were were power hungry and they did some things and you know these theories sometimes people make it their mission to counter that theory and krishna consciousness can get sidelined so that that could be a big problem with conspiracy theories mm -hmm. so that there is certainly intelligence is involved over there in coming up with a theory also in justifying the theory but at the end that intelligence is centered more on skepticism of the world and whoever is in the world even if there are devotees in the world then the focus is not so much on faith in krishna but on skepticism of the world mm. any thoughts about this yeah that what a beautiful set of comments i really appreciate that it reminded me of a famous lecture shiva bhakti siddhanta gave at radhakund you may must be familiar with we said that our goal is not anartha nibritti but is artha prabritti okay our, our goal we, we don't want to become free from anarthas rather we want to become absorbed in krishna and if all that we see is maya this is maya that's maya and we're just conscious of maya and sometimes devotees think that being conscious of maya is krishna consciousness <laughs> yeah <laughs> i i see all the faults and everything and it's not krishna consciousness at all <laughs> i i was also appreciating I, i i think part of the problem is sometimes with the conspiracy ideas and things too is that you were mentioning about some things which are unpleasant to even mention people get concerned about the society and the way iskon is gone but i think part of that problem is is that it, it's a, it's a manifestation of our own lack of krishna consciousness our own shallow krishna consciousness where i'm identifying myself with the institution or i'm identifying the institution with krishna consciousness the institution as we spoke before is a medium to give krishna consciousness but shil prabhupad in nectar devotion says there are many society many krishna conscious societies and someone would do well to join one of them it's not that iskon is the only one in fact I, says, I, sorry prabhupad says that there are many societies and we can join any one sorry yes many krishna and someone should join one oh okay so and is prabhupad referring to various centers of iskon or is referring no, no, in general to different he's... He's speaking about different Vaishnavas. Really? Okay. And he spoke that way about his God brothers and in his purports, and he spoke that way about his God brothers in his books and in his other. There's so many Vaishnavas, but yeah. this is our state of some of the missions we spoke the last few times. Yeah, really. Shri Prabhupada, and I, I want to serve that state of some of the mission, but to return, look back at what we spoke about before, I don't put that as my identity. if i identify with it then i then i think oh my god that there's this big problem is this the krishna's in control and my business is is to be krishna conscious and, and the, but i'm not in control of everything that's that's an inherent problem i think with conspiracy ideas and the blame game is the root of that is that i think that i'm the controller and i'm frustrated with it 
I, I heard something very distressing recently that that some devotees are, are so distressed right now about the situation in the world and trying to figure out what happened and, and, and who's behind everything that some devotees have become so depressed. Some initiated devotees I heard in Europe, they're now taking drugs because they just, they just became so disturbed by the situation in the world today. So, so, so if, if we're not... Like antidepressants or literally narcotic drugs? Well, like, like marijuana and alcohol and whatever like that. And I, I think the, the, the point is, is that if we're not taking shelter of Krishna through hearing and chanting, then we're in trouble. <laughs> we're, we're in big trouble. And if we just see all the bad things, we just see maya, maya, maya. Where's the hope? And what, what is, this movement's not about Maya. We're, we're in, in America, you didn't grow up with the born-again Christians, although you've probably met a few of them. <laughs> I grew up with them. <laughs> oh, okay. and maybe, I think I met when I was, I don't know, six or eight years old. My family were Baptists, and then they decided to become Methodists. I can't even tell you the difference between the two, but I remember when we became Methodists, my grandmother cried for two weeks. And she said, you're going to go to hell. I can't even tell you the difference between the two. But she said, and so there's some very dogmatic people like that. I mean, we're, we're used to, to that kind of framework sometimes in the West. where We're trying to approach, we see Krishna consciousness in that way. And that's the, their, their approach, the, those kind of religionists. And they're, in one sense, those kind of Christians, they're also our brothers. Because they're propounding something spiritual, something anti-material, good qualities and things. I think we should see them as our brothers. But I'm not very attracted by their general presentation that you're bad and you're bad and you're going to go to hell. And just focusing on the sins and faults of people. Yes. And that's not bhakti. That is very, so true. Now, it's not just the sins and faults of others. Then eventually what happens it it becomes not just outside world it becomes devotees also and then we start doing with devotees also and then it becomes a problem i was reading one book about conspiracy theories and one statement over there struck me a lot the author says that uh, where many people presume malevolence there are some bad people out there out to get us he says most often ignorance or incompetence are sufficient explanations. <laughs> Ignorance <laughs> or incompetence. Yeah. <laughs> so now if you consider the COVID crisis itself, now it could be that say one particular country has launched a biochemical war against the whole world. But, <laughs> but you know, it's ignorance or incompetence seems to be a much more feasible explanation because in many ways, the world today is so complicated that for any one agency or one country or one power to launch a conspiracy that can actually cover the whole world, <laughs> it, it is quite uh, unlikely. So most often when people, even people do something that hurts us, it is either because they don't know, they're just ignorant, or they are not able to do the right thing well. So it's mostly ignorance or incompetence. So I felt that this explanation acknowledges that things are wrong, but it takes away the persecution complex to some extent. That is, there's somebody out there to get me. Hey, let me let me share with you yeah. uh, something. Why don't you enable my screen sharing? Yeah, just a minute. This is a beautiful quote from uh, Aldous Huxley, the famous uh, British philosopher and writer. Yes, I think uh, you can share now. Just check. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Let's see. So I'll go ahead and read this too. The effects that follow the constant and intense concentration upon evil are always disastrous. Those who crusade not for God and themselves, but against the demons and others, never succeed in making the world better. No man can concentrate his attention on evil or even the idea of evil and remain unaffected. To be more against the demon than for godliness is exceedingly dangerous. Every crusader is apt to go mad. He's haunted by the wickedness that he attributes to his enemies. It becomes sort of a part of him. 
it's a beautiful statement. And I, uh, I found a number of similar statements also in Narada Purana, in Mahabharata, that this concentration on evil, that's not what Krishna consciousness is all about. And, and, and such persons, they never succeed in making the world a better place. Mm. You know, just when I was reading this quote, it struck me that not, there, is, there is in the Ubdesh Amrut, there is that verse about how the topmost devotees, Anya Nindadi Shunyardha Mipsita Sangalabdhya. Right, right. And they avoid criticizing others. And also in the Bhagavad Gita, also the godly nature, it is said, Apaishunam, the aversion to fault finding. That's 16.2. So normally we think about don't speak the faults of others or don't criticize others. But we could extend that is don't obsess on the evil in others also. And this is what he's saying. That yeah. if you obsess on the evil in others, then it's amazing what the quote is saying is that that will actually bring out the evil within us. And, yes. and I have seen there are some devotees uh, that uh, again, no disrespect to them, but it's almost they they have this idea that there is there is there is a particular group of people, like you said, conser the conservatives are out to take over the movement, and they are out to crush control and crush everything, or the liberals are out to control and crush everything. So, in general, there is now there are two aspects to this I would like to discuss. One is that. There's a transcendental vision that Krishna has the ultimate plan and everything is in Krishna's control, as you said. Simultaneously, at a practical level, if there are some dangers, they need to be dealt with. So, say, let's if we consider the, uh, the COVID crisis right now. So, you know, a conspiracy theory that there's somebody out there to get the whole world out. And that, that we, I mean, I would say that's it's everything is possible, but it's not probable. And even if it were, one of my concerns with conspiracy theories is that okay, even if it were true, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> how is it that how are we going to make any major difference with it? So, so then the question comes up that there is also something practical that we have to do to deal with the situation. And if we have a better understanding of what is happening, then we can deal with it practically better. So how can we balance this idea that Krishna is ultimately in control and I'm meant to be Krishna conscious and simultaneously, you know, I have to act in the world to deal with the problems of the world. So how can we be both transcendent, have a transcendental vision and do the necessary practical action, whatever is required. Yeah, Srila Prabhupada famously told that to Giriraj Maharaj. <laughs> we have to be practical. I, I, I can't remember the exact phrase, but I, I think you, you know the exchange. He, he was asking him something, what is, uh, how is the movement going to go on? He said something about like chanting Hare Krishna Prabhupada. Yeah. And Prabhupada said, no, <laughs> by, by, means, by, by being practical. Well, Prabhupada wanted that, but at the same time, I, I feel obliged to point out something too, that Giri Raj Maharaj was someone Srila Prabhupada was very close to Prabhupada, Prabhupada loved him, and Prabhupada gave him a big responsibility of management. And I personally have not gotten that responsibility, thank God. <laughs> and so I should act according to my means. Krishna in the Gita, he says that better to do your duty even if it's imperfect, then do someone else's duty perfectly. Mm. And that's part of the same mentality, too, that of the conspiracy idea and things. And I, I very much appreciate your point. It's something I think of, too. I, I don't like to argue with somebody who wants to come and say there's this big conspiracy and, and all the scientists are against us or this or that. I, I don't know. I'm just a simple Hare Krishna devotee. I'm living in Mayapur in this little room. I don't know everything that's going on. But even if it's true, what am I supposed to do about it? And there definitely is a conspiracy on behalf of Maya and her agents to keep us in this material world. But I want to see beyond Maya. I want to see Krishna. And, and the, 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 no matter what you, you can point out, it is the fault or is the conspiracy. And maybe you, knew, you figured it out. 
Or maybe you haven't. Maybe you spend your whole life and you, you haven't really figured it out. Or maybe you find somehow you do figure it out. The solution is going to be the same. There's really only one solution. Ranjan Maharaj, he comments to us sometimes, like, as the devotees write him letters, Maharaj, I have this problem. And Maharaj always says, I only, I, only have, I only have one solution. <laughs> and that's Krishna consciousness. That's chanting Hare Krishna, reading Srimad Bhagavatam. That's the only solution. And I want to be a Hare Krishna devotee. I, I, I can't say that I am. I'm aspiring for that, as we spoke before. But uh, I want to have faith in this process. And I want to see behind the curtain, as they would say in The Wizard of Oz, there's a famous movie, and there's a man behind the curtain who's doing everything. I want to see behind the curtain. And I want to see behind that man. I want to see Krishna's hand in everything and see that this is Krishna giving something to me for my good because Krishna cares for me. It, it becomes, I, I find this time right now, we were speaking about the COVID thing, but I, I appreciate your other comments about the society. And I, I applaud uh, how you've done that because it's not just the COVID thing, but there's, it's, a, it's a bigger issue behind all of that. And that's what I was wanting to speak about originally, which is the blame game. We're always, looking to blame someone else to blame something it, it's you know they did some conspiracy against Prabhupada or this or that There's so many ideas people have but they're not accepting that Krishna's in control and they're, they're not accepting I, I, I'll just be very blunt there's no GDC there's no temple president who can spoil my Krishna consciousness I'm the only one who can do that there's nobody who can do that and as long as I'm Krishna conscious, everything's going to be okay. And that's the best solution I can give for, for our movement and for our world. I, I don't see any other solution. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a very powerful statement that actually nobody can spoil our Krishna conscious except we ourselves. And, uh, you know, maybe we, I would like to place this in the context of our previous discussions where we talked about how you know, within an institution, devotees need to create space for themselves. So, and if that space is not there, we feel choked. Mm -hmm. So now creating space is involving at some level, some practical action. You know, that at a, because I might be told to do things in a particular way, but I do it in somewhat different way. So at one level, we understand Krishna is in control. At another level, we also need to see what is it that Krishna wants me to do in this situation. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, one thing is I chant and I st study the Bhagavatam and do directly Krishna conscious activities. Uh, I, and so one thing we could say, no conspiracy theory or any blame game should consume us so much that it deters us from our direct sadhana, from our direct connection with Krishna. So uh, it, it could well happen that it, uh, the idea of a conspiracy theory can become Maya's conspiracy to distract us from Krishna. That our very belief in conspiracy theory can distract us. So at one level, we make sure that our direct Krishna conscious activities are going on well. Now, apart from that, uh, there, is, uh, there is my remaining services there, my professional life, my family life. Everything, my, our Bhakti sadhana is one part of our life. But in the remaining part of our life, when we have to face situations, we have to decide, okay, how does Krishna want me to act in this situation? So now, so some devotees may, if, we, if I can continue this point of the blame game or a conspiracy theory, some devotees may start feeling that, uh, you know, actually this is the real problem. The real problem is that say all allopathic medicine is just a big money-making racket and there are alternative medicines and they will cure you. So now, okay, now there are some devotees who might be in alternative medicine that might have benefited them and if it has cured them, wonderful, of some diseases. So, so there could be if a particular devotee is inspired by a particular cause. Mm -hmm. So then if, if that cause leads to some tangible constructive action, rather than simply I uh, say criticism of some like a pervasive enemy 
So for example, if you consider this COVID case only, that in, if there is only a const constant criticism of allopathy, that this whole is simply a money-making business, then that would be much more negative. On the other hand, if somebody does something, okay, this is alternative medicine, this is alternative branch of medicine that works, and this is what can be done to explore it, to test it, to adopt it. So if we do something positive, and that becomes our primary focus, rather than say criticizing that which we perceive as negative, then it will be much more constructive. Isn't it? Yes, very, very nice. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of uh, uh, alluded your question earlier before. I'm sorry. Yeah. And that is we have to have some practicality also. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my particular role in the society, uh, I'm, I focus more on ideas than I do on management. That's, yeah, of course. So, <laughs> so yeah. but, but management is very, very important. And it reminds me of a statement that uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told the Radhanath Das Goswami. He said, Anta Nishta Bahir Vyavahar, that internally you be fixed in Krishna consciousness, you be fixed in Krishna consciousness, but externally you act like an ordinary person. And so I find even amongst devotees, when we speak about management, of course, this is a Krishna consciousness movement. And we can we, we do proper did place stress on the proper management of monies, proper construction of buildings and, and life members and management organization like that. But everything was always to be Krishna conscious. Everything was always to encourage individuality and, and, and free thinking as we were discussing before. Uh, so if, if we don't do that, then we're, we're in the wrong movement. But at the same time, I find this is Mahaprabhu instructed Raghunath Das, Antonisha Bahya Vyavahar, that if you do that, and sometimes we go and we say, just be Krishna conscious, just chant Hare Krishna, and people look at you and say, that's not practical, people. I need to do something else. And it's a fact we do need to do something else. Why do we need to do something else? In one sense, really, all we need to do is chant Hare Krishna. And Hari Bhakti Vilas, Sanatana Goswami, gives a list of a bunch of verses from different shastras describing how if you just chant the holy name, you don't need to take medicine. And the holy name will cure any disease. And I remember our Guru is giving a class about that once. <laughs> and after the class, Jagadat Mahaprabhu, his god brother and friend, was there. And he said, but Guru Maharaj, he said, you take medicine. <laughs> <laughs> And Guru he replied then said, yes, I'm not, a, very humbly, he said, I'm not on that level, and we shouldn't imitate that. And I don't know, I'm not going to try to comment on, <laughs> on what level my Guru Maharaj is on, that's another matter. But I don't think it's appropriate for us as a society to practically just tell everybody, just chant Hare Krishna, and that'll solve everything, although that will solve everything. But the problem is, we don't have sufficient faith in it. And so then we need to have other things. People need to think, yeah, something's going on. They're collecting lots of money. They're collecting lots of money. We're making lots of life members and this and that. But the, really, the real thing that's going on is if we're pleasing Srila Prabhupada, we're pleasing Krishna. That's the real thing. And then they'll do everything else. But some people, they, they, because their faith is not that deep, they need to see this. And I think as a society, I, I think Srila Prabhupada acknowledged that by creating the society. He created this international society, as we spoke last time, too. Otherwise, Prabhupada could have just sat under a tree, as, as he told uh, some of the early devotees. He said, we don't even need this society. Yeah. But because people need to belong to something, and they need to see, oh, this is, this is a solution going on, then we have so much management, we have so many divisions and things, and we shouldn't minimize those. It's like someone minimizing Vanashram Dharma. Vanashram Dharma is important. It's very important for 99% of the population until we come to, to a, a superior level of faith. But when we're doing that Vanashram, it should be Daivi Vanashram. We should always be plugging in the, the electric current of, of Bhakti and always, always getting them to, to chant more and, do it, and then we're raising up the consciousness. Otherwise, if, if there's so many societies in the world, as we both know, 
who are much better managers than us. That's true. <laughs> There's so many who are more expert at making money. There's even societies who are more expert in counseling and, and taking yeah. care of people's problems like that than we are. But our special quality as a society is bhakti. And so we, we need those other things. I acknowledge that. And how those other things will come up. Well, I want to respect the managers and leaders because that's their job to, to come forward and do that. And it's a duty of devotees who are acting as preachers or thinkers and writers to inspire them to always be Krishna conscious and give them Krishna conscious solutions. But it's those thinkers' jobs to let them manage things and even let them make mistakes because that, that's, that's their responsibility. It's like a child has to learn. And we don't learn without making mistakes. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that's true. So you now you're dif uh, clearly di differentiating between the domain of ideas and the domain of, say, management, which is the domain of, say, practical action mm. to some extent. So now if somebody is coming up with a conspiracy theory, uh, would that fall in the domain of ideas or would that fall in the domain of action? <laughs> because if the person may do both. So let me give an example of a recent incident, uh, which I was interacting with a devotee. So this devotee told me that how when the British came to India, they made a long term plan to, to interpret the Vedic literature in a way that would make Indians lose faith in them. Mm -hmm. So Max Muller was a prominent Indologist. He wrote a letter to his wife, quite a famous or infamous letter that, you know, he will translate these books in such a way that Indians will see the error of their own belief systems and then they will give it up. So now he also says that it, it will take me, I will not be able to see the fruit of my work in my lifetime. It will be a long term work. So then uh, this door is saying that right now in India, similarly, there is a uh, conspiracy afoot to, to Christianize all of India. And we need to counter that. Now, in some ways, now both these facts that yes, Max Miller did have a long term vision to, to make Indians lose their faith in their literature. And yes, there is a lot of extensive missionary efforts going on. So now if some devotee can see the big picture and understand, okay, this is what is happening. So this is also in the domain of ideas. Okay, there is a concerted effort to, to say undermine spiritual culture or the Vedic Dharmic culture of India. And then there is some kind of action to be done to counter it. Hmm? So would we, would we call this kind of like a bigger vision of things? Now this itself can become an obsession of some people. And then sometimes they may start seeing every problem. Oh, this must be, this must be if any particular, uh, say Indian spiritual teacher has a, some, uh, some scandal or something like that. Oh, this must be a conspiracy of the Christians to put him down. So you can do like that also. So basically, there's a difference between having a bigger picture of things so that one understands what is going on and getting obsessed with that and going into the zone of conspiracy theories. Because sometimes I have also seen that while I agree with this point that yes, there, there could be a much more, that there is a concerted effort. But sometimes I feel that the devotees who get into this, they become more, you could say, anti-Christian conscious or anti-conversion conscious than Krishna conscious. And they feel that you are being too impractical. Now, you are not really aware of the reality of the world. That, so at one, so I was not talking in terms of practical management, but I was talking in this sense about, you know, a devotee has to find out uh, with the vision I have of things, what is the role I can play? What is the contribution I can play? So any thoughts on this? Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I, there's a lot of people we can't speak to. There's some people you just they, they just have their conception, their idea, and they just have to go with that. 
you can tell them that, that, that no Krishna consciousness is a real solution, but if they're in the mode of passion, then they're going to see money as a solution, or they're going to see management as a solution, or they're going to see power as a solution, or, or, or expose. We're going to expose all the bastards and put all this information on the internet, and that's going to be the solution. And the problem I have with all those so-called solutions is that ultimately, especially if they're coming from devotees, they give another message. And the other message that they give, a subtle message, which is definitely there, which is that uh, chanting Hare Krishna is okay, but it won't solve all your problems. If you really want to be serious, then you need to do expose. You need to you know, expose a conspiracy. You need to deal with money, you need to do this or that, and that's a real, real, uh, real solution for things. Integral also in that, in that attitude of what I call the self-appointed reformers hmm. is the idea that, that they're actually appointed by Krishna. They're thinking like that. We don't have anything. It's not that we're, we want to propagate that everybody should just sit down and talk philosophy and just lay on their back and chant Hare Krishna and not do anything. That's contrary to the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna's telling Arjuna, you go and fight and you kill them all. Right? So I found that when I speak with devotees like this sometimes, and then they, they come and they're what I would call a little sarcastically, I'm sorry, they're on a mission from God. It's like he, what do you call it, hijad in, in Islam, that uh, I, I have this. this this uh, uh, mission I have to do, I have to expose everybody, I have to do this and that. And they really feel like sometimes that Krishna has appointed them. Okay, that's fine. Maybe, maybe Krishna has. But there's a bigger thing behind all that also. When we talk about a society, I can start waving my hands and jumping up and down and saying that, that I know everybody's wrong and I'm the only one who does know. But the next question, and maybe I'm right, <laughs> but the next question, who's going to listen to me? And if, and, if, and if I can't get the devotees to listen to me, what's the value of my huffing and puffing and saying so many things? And the devotees, they, the mass of devotees in our society, they want to hear from Shastra. They want to hear what Srila Prabhupada has to say. Because in general, when we talk about reformers, or the reformer, the ultimate reformer is, is a pure devotee. The ultimate reformer is guru. And there's a beautiful statement from Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta yeah, Sarasvati. I just, I just found that statement while you're talking. Should I Which, share that? Uh, yeah, there's a couple of statements from him about the reforming a reformer. Oh, yeah. Is this the one? The world stands in no need of any reformer? Yes, that's beautiful. I was thinking of that, but I had another one too. But go ahead and share that. I was also thinking of that. Okay. So, the, Don't you go ahead and read it. the world stands in no need of any reformer. The world has a very competent person for guiding its minutest happenings. The person who determines that there is scope for reform of the world himself stands in need of reform. The world goes on in its own perfect way. No person can deflect it even the breadth of a hair from the course chalked out for it by providence. When we perceive any change being actually affected in the course of events of this world by the agency of any particular individual, we must know very well that the agent possesses no real power at any stage. <laughs> the agent finds himself driven forward by a force belonging to a different category from himself. The course of the world does not require to be changed by the agency of any person. What is necessary is to change our outlook on this world. The scriptures declare that it is only necessary to listen with an open mind to the name of Krishna from the lips of a bona fide devotee. As soon as Krishna enters the listening ear, he clears up the vision of, vision of the listener so that he no longer has any ambition of ever acting the part of a reformer of any other person because he finds that nobody is left without the very highest guidance. It is therefore his own reform by the grace of God whose supreme necessity and nature he is increasingly able to realize by the eternally continuing mercy of the Supreme Lord. Wow. What a profound statement. Very profound. You know, okay. uh, so two, three points about this. Now, 
this you mentioned this point that power is the solution exposing is the solution so now all of these we can say at one level they might be parts of a solution sometimes bringing awareness of a problem or maybe say bringing some change in the power structure in the management what that might be a part of the solution but when we start giving it greater priority than being krishna conscious so then we just like push krishna consciousness to the uh, there is a saying in india that you know that you push someone upstairs <laughs> <laughs> that, that means you nominally respect that person but relegate them out from all practical uh, practical dealings don't take their guidance in any practical way just nominally venerate them that way so there could be a tendency of pushing pushing krishna conscious upwards upstairs and thinking that this is the real solution krishna consciousness can, can come afterward so so this is it's not that this need not be a solution but we just need to keep our priority right is that what you are hinting at that's part of it um first of all let me just make a real quick comment on this beautiful statement from shiva bhakti siddhanta which is also one of my favorites uh when he says as soon as krishna enters a listening ear he clears up the vision of that li- of the listener so he no longer has any ambition of ever acting the part of reformer of any other person because he finds that nobody is left without the very highest guidance so that's very interesting indirectly what he's stating here is this is a symptom of proper hearing if you're hearing properly then it means that that you you don't you no longer have an ambition to reform anyone because you see everybody has the highest guidance and therefore he says his own reform he's able to to realize and at that point he's able to become a real instrument for the lord i had another i a statement from shiva bhakti siddhanta in mind let me uh share this with you can i have the screen back yeah can you share i got it yeah this is from a letter uh in um I don't know what year let's see in 1931 from Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta I received your card dated November 26 and another letter following that Shiva Bhagavatam has instructed us not to praise or criticize others nature or activities it is said also in Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat that one goes to hell by criticizing others my instruction to you is not to criticize others but to correct and purify yourself and then he says I am forced to criticize my own disciples and those who have come to me for instruction i do not understand why you would go out of your way to try to perform such a difficult task <laughs> oh god so, amazing so this this reminds me very much of some statements from my guru maharaj where he spoke very strongly that uh fault finding and correction is the business of guru now let's back up to that statement for a moment what is guru guru is someone who is empowered by krishna arjun is guru and and here for krishna is nimitta matram baba sabhi sachin that means sakshad that it nimitta matram baba sabhi sachin you be my instrument means sakshad that it and he's endowed with the potency of krishna and therefore he can do something so it's not my business to go and say arjun you know you shouldn't be going around and fighting with people and you're just on this this trip of trying to control everybody and he's empowered by krishna and i should just get out of the way and so theoretically there may be persons who are also empowered by shiva prabhupad or krishna to reform our society but i have the right to be convinced I, I i i you have to convince me and i and, and our society has that right and as far as that goes with myself if i see that you're not taking shelter of bhakti if you, or if you're criticizing other people huh? as you were quoting uh, uh, earlier from upadesh i'm reading nindari shunya hidam ipsi to sanga labdya i want ipsi to sanga labdya i want to associate with that person who's nindari shunya hidam whose heart is free from the propensity to criticize others that criticism means you're disqualified if it's just mundane criticism now 
Prabhupada, you may say, but Prabhupada criticized. You want to, Prabhupada is guru. You want to continue sharing the screen or we can have full screen, continue discussion? Yeah, we can have full screen. Sorry. sorry. Yeah. So you're saying so, about Prabhupada, yeah. Yeah, Prabhupada is guru. And, and I think if we slow down a little bit, when we, we say, well, Prabhupada chastised people, and I should also chastise people, and Prabhupada called them hogs, dogs, camels, and asses, and so I should also go and do like that. We need to start spitting in the sky. And anything, And you know what happens when you spit in the sky. It, it comes and lands on your own face. So if I'm not qualified, if I've not been empowered to do that, and again, the question comes because there's, there's a long queue of people who are lining up and telling you they're empowered. There's a long queue of people who are, who are directly or indirectly telling me that they know the real Siddhanta, they know the real truth about this conspiracy theory or about this thing or that thing. They've got the real deal and I should listen to them. So what are we going to do? It's like going to the market and there's a thousand people trying to sell you their goods, and they're all saying their good is the best goods. So we have to be discerning. As a society, we have to be discerning and as individuals. And I want to be convinced by Guru Sadhu and Shastra. I want to see that your solution is in line with Bhakti. I'm not saying that, that if, you're, if you're taking a bow and arrow like Arjuna, you're going to, your solution is to kill a bunch of people on the battlefield. I'm not going to say that's Maya. He's Krishna conscious. Or somebody, maybe Krishna wants him to make money or build a building or do whatever, or chastise people. But I, want, I have to see the character of someone because chastisement is a work of guru. And guru is someone who has the qualities of Krishna. We see they're very gentle and we can intuitively understand that they, they have some care for me. And if I don't have that faith in them, then their reform is not going to work for the society, for, for our Iskand society. Mm. They're just huffing and puffing like, like the big bad uh, wolf <laughs> in the literature I used to read when I was a little boy. <laughs> okay. So, you know, this quote, I'll just refer to that once again. They're saying, why do you want to go out of your way to take an extremely <laughs> difficult task of criticizing others? So I was it's thinking, <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that actually it's difficult in many ways. First of all, our criticism may not be precise. Because we may not really know all the facts of the situation. Secondly, even if we criticize, it can often have many unexpected counterproductive effects. So both in terms of understanding what is wrong and then doing something to correct it, it can be a very complicated issue. And so when you talk about it's a guru's task to do that. And uh, earlier you mentioned about like a self-appointed reformer. So the difference we could say critically is how strong is one's own connection with Krishna. That if one is very deeply connected with Krishna, then we could say that dadami buddhi yogam tam yena mamupayanti. Maybe they are giving, getting some intelligence from Krishna. So then somebody might do this, but it is uh, it is much better to so maybe do this in one's own sphere and bring about some change bring about some results rather than just criticize the whole system. Isn't it? It's like, even if say I have been guided by Krishna. So if you take Prabhupada's example itself, Prabhupada did not spend much time. He was quite disappointed with all due respects to the, his God brothers and the Gaudiya Mutt. He was disappointed because they did not have so much of a missionary spirit. He felt, but, but he did not spend time criticizing them too much. Maybe one or two Vyas Puja offerings where he speaks a little strongly saying that we should preach. But after that, he just started, he just did whatever, whatever, uh, whatever energy he had, whatever time he had, whatever resources he had. With that, he started. And then he continued his service and then Krishna provided a result. And Krishna provided an extraordinary result. So we could say that in a sense, even if something is going wrong, Rather than criticizing what is wrong, it's better to start doing what is right. And then my own reform can mean both my internal connection with Krishna and it can also mean my external contribution. But it's better to focus on doing some positive contribution 
rather than criticizing what somebody else is doing wrong. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, uh, we made a magazine which we spoke about in our last discussions uh, called Putana, False yes. Gurus, Institutions, yeah. and the Holy Name. And I, I, that article, I've noted, is a little popular amongst a lot of people, and they point out the faults in organized religion. They say, just see, we've got this and this. But an irony that I see is that the people who oftentimes are shouting the loudest about the need of reform, they're shouting the loudest and pointing the blame of this and that, they're the problem themselves because they become Putana. Putana is a false guru who, who wants to present herself that she's offering some nourishment to the baby, but her real, des her real desire is to kill the baby. And so similarly, if we appoint ourselves as guru and appoint ourselves as a self-appointed reformer, and we're running around jumping up and down, Bhaktivinoda you know, says that Putin is, is the, the bad mind, the non-Krishna conscious mind. Mm -hmm. That's also Putana. So such persons, are not, they're not helping the situation. It, it reminds me of, of Prabhupada's description in the light of the Bhagavad, how uh, in the nighttime, the, in, in, during the darkness, it's the time of self-appointed reformers. And they're like the fireflies, Prabhupada. He doesn't speak yeah. about self-appointed reformers, but he speaks about the fireflies. And those fireflies, they look very brilliant at night. But as soon as the sun rises, they're, they're completely insignificant. So on our own, by our own strength, we may shout a lot and do this and that. But if someone's actually appointed by Krishna, then by them speaking Krishna consciousness, by them chanting, everything will become clear. And we should have firm faith in that. Although in our society, we have managers, we have accountants, Accountants, we have construction workers, we have money collectors, we, we have so many different important services which never should be minimized. At the same time, the real reform is accomplished through Krishna consciousness. And let me give one example of that. There's, there's several I could think of, but one is uh, in Jaiva Dharma, there's a story of that uh, person, his name I think was Sanyasi Thakur or something, later became Vaishnav Das. And he was in Benares, the, the center of impersonalism. And he was a hardcore Mayavadi. He was on the platform of uh, Paramahansa. He was reciting Vedanta every day. He was a very dry person. And he became a Hare Krishna devotee. How did he become a devotee? Nobody said anything to him. There was no debate. There was no, he didn't even read anything. All that happened, he was going to the market one day and he saw a devotee. And that devotee was such an advanced person. He was so absorbed in Krishna consciousness. He was rolling on the ground and crying and calling out, Ha, Goranga, Ha, Nitai. And he had this funny tilak on. <laughs> funny to that Mayavadi. <laughs> Two lines going up. And he just saw him for a moment. Wow, who is that guy? And, and, and then he, he, he lost sight of him. And then he started asking people about it. Somebody said, oh, this was Hare Krishna people. And they lived in Mayapur. And that's how he became a devotee. Then he came. He had faith in someone because he saw the potency of someone. And we shouldn't uh, have any doubt. This is what Shiva Prabhupada did. He came and sat underneath a tree in Tompkins Square Park with a pair of cartels. And he was so absorbed and so powerful that he struck people and people wanted to change their lives. He didn't come and say, look, I've got a great management idea. I know how to manage your money. I know how to do some counseling and, and psychiatry for you. He didn't say any of those things. He was just Krishna conscious. It's a very, very powerful thing. Now, I, I, again, I'm not trying to minimize management. Mm -hmm. that, that should also go on. But we, we, have to, we have to understand the best example, the, be, the best preaching is our example. In the words of, uh, I've heard a saying from... Um, the Sisi, you know this one? Yeah. He said something to the effect I've heard that, that he told his followers you should preach. And if necessary, you should say something also. Yeah. <laughs> preach all day and speak a few words when necessary. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Okay. So, you know, this also, I mean, since what, if I get what you're saying is that our 
our Krishna consciousness, as it is reflected through our actions, is going to cause the biggest transformation. And in that sense, in trying to bring a transformation in the world, if we lose our Krishna consciousness, then we are putting the cart before the horse. So it is our Krishna consciousness that will bring about a transformation. And uh, you know, I agree with you about, fully about this. I mean, just uh, going back to Prabhupada's example of Prabhupada's potency, sitting at Tompkins Square Park and, Park and chanting. Now we could also say that Prabhupada did the practical effort of going to America. You know, he could have sat under a tree in Rindavan and that the, the chanting also. <laughs> he didn't do that. So, so there was a practical effort. So he so that means there is a simultaneous combination of the transcendental. At a practical level, Prabhupada labored a lot to get the facility to go to America and then find a place over there and do all that. But he was not consumed ever by the practical. Mm -hmm. So I think that is what Prabhupada, it said about Prabhupada. His head was in the sky, but his feet were on the ground. So yeah, let's go back a few steps too. Yeah. What was Srila Prabhupada's success? What was the cause of Srila Prabhupada's success in America? I would say it was not just the fact that he got a, a ticket on the Jaladuta. Yeah. It wasn't the fact just that, that he talked to Dr. Misha or that he got a, a storefront or this or that. But it's Krishna. We can ask the same question. Who was it that killed all the Kauravas in the Battle of Kurukshetra? And someone may say it's Arjun. But was it really Arjun? Krishna says, Nimitta Mata Baba Sabi Sachin. Now, of course, Arjun was the immediate cause for that thing. We, we see the immediate cause. And as a exa wonderful example you gave or you followed up with, Srila Prabhupada, we have to do our duty, but Krishna is the one who's actually doing it. And, and, and the Guru tells us, go to the West and preach, and then we work hard to get a, a ticket on the steamship. We do whatever we can. And, we're, and Krishna gives credit to that devotee. He gives credit to Srila Prabhupada. But in another sense, we see it's Krishna behind it. We, Krishna gave, gives credit to Arjun for killing all those warriors, but ultimately it was Krishna who did that. Okay, so in that sense, again, it is for us as well as others. Like Bhakti Sanat Thakur in that quote says that if any person seems to bring about a change, it is actually <laughs> God who is, it is actually a principle categorically different from them that is bringing out the change through them. So in that sense, when we see either some devotee or even somebody who is not a devotee, they bring about some social change. We, we need to be able to see Krishna as the ultimate agent behind that. Now, just uh, going back to the, the earlier point about, say, say like a transcendental action and practical action. So, if a devotee feels inspired, driven, say, to maybe uh, counter Christian conversion in India, or if the devotee feels inspired to counter what he what they feel is you know allopathic medicine is has many side effects and is destructive so i would like to share ayurveda ayurvedic wisdom or a devotee feels inspired that say some devotees in india may feel inspired by a nationalistic zeal some devotees in america might feel that there is systemic racism over there and we want to counter all the racism over there so so now, if a devotee wants to get engaged in such causes because they see that there are certain, in their vision, there are problems in society. And uh, so perceiving like big problems in society and not getting caught in a conspiracy theory. So how could we differentiate between the two? That conspiracy theory in one sense, my understanding would be that we make one thing to be the cause of various or all problems. So it's like almost it's scapegoating. Now this, if this is removed, then all problems will be solved. So uh, if, if you could, if you could instill that in people, it would solve a lot of problems. If we could see what is the difference. Honestly, Jiva Goswami and Bhakti Sundarbha 
he raises an interesting question. He says, why is it that some people attracted to bogus ideas, bogus shastras, bogus gurus? Okay. And he says there, he quotes a couple of verses from Brahma Vaivarta Purana, which describe it as due to sin in the heart. Now, as devotees, knowing Madhuri Kadambani, we can append that also, we can say offenses as devotees, perhaps too. So, first of all, we generally can't see the difference between what, what actually Krishna wants me to do and what is just my mundane vision. And we just really can't see the difference. So then what are we going to do? And therefore we have an ashram dharma. Therefore we have a society guided by guru. And therefore the first thing that we're told, generally speaking, in Varnashram Dharma is to find like-minded association. And we have a Brahman Sasan where Brahmins work together and they're encouraged and inspired and empowered in their work. We have Chhatris who work together and Vaishas and et cetera like that. But in our Daivi Vanashram system, they're simultaneously chanting Hare Krishna. And that chanting of Hare Krishna, we know, is the all-important thing. And what will happen is Chaito Darkan and Marjan that by that chanting, their heart will gradually become cleansed. Bhakti you know, in one place, he says that the darpana or the mirror of the heart is so dirty that you can scrub and scrub. It's like a, a oil on a mirror and you can wipe it and wipe it, but it doesn't get clean. But if you keep wiping after some time, you start to see some vague image. And that vague image is my position within Van Ashram that I, I should be a grihasta, that I should uh, do brahminical work, or that I should be a manager, or whatever. That, that's, that's the first thing that I begin to see. And then if I keep cleaning the mirror, cleaning and cleaning, then I can see myself, and maybe I can even see Krishna standing behind me. Mm -hmm. So I, I think a big question comes, as, as I think it was John Lennon who wrote, we all want to change the world, right? <laughs> in the White Owl. Uh, how do we become a vehicle for change? And, and for me, this is a really, really heartfelt, very important topic because I joined the Hare Krishna movement for this reason. When I got out of high school, I, I graduated from high school in San Jose, California. And I hitchhiked that summer all the way to Washington, D.C. with a friend. A long, long journey with no money because I... Yeah, all the, I hitchhiked all the way to the other side of the country because I wanted to attain, attend a political rally because I wanted to, to, to be, a, you know, be a, a cause for some change. And we went there and we all got tear gassed <laughs> and beaten up by the police. And then the news didn't even say anything about it. And I got discouraged and I saw it. And, and I tried over the years before I came to Krishna consciousness, I tried political solutions I've seen money solutions. I've seen psychological solutions and counseling solutions and, and so astrology solutions and so many solutions. But I came here because I don't believe in any of those solutions. And I'm not, I'm not saying it in a negative way, as we spoke in the beginning, but I see that Krishna Bhakti is the only solution. It's a positive solution. It's not negative. So if we want to be a vehicle for change, I think we have to look very, we have to become Krishna's instrument. Now, some people like Arjun, they're, the way that they become Krishna's instrument is to fight. And someone else may go to America on a boat and someone else may make a million dollars to build a temple. And we can't say that one is better than the other because they're all very dear to Krishna. They're all empowered by Krishna. But the fund, uh, underlying principle of all of them is the same, that I want to be Krishna's instrument. And, and I want to give up the bad idea that I'm the reformer, that I'm the doer, as you were giving this beautiful quote. And as soon as we give up that idea that I'm the reforming, then I can actually be an instrument of reform. Amazing. The two, three thoughts I got, each of them could be elaborated, but just I'll mention it quickly. When you talk about Varanashram, what you are mentioning is more like like-minded association. That Varanashram is not necessarily like a division of society, but it is like-minded association which helps us understand how we can contribute. And uh, in the, for example, in the Vedic culture, the king is called Naradeva. That's uh, the God on earth. 
so it's not just so much like people should respect the king like god but actually the king should be connected with god king should actually be acting as a representative of god and doing uh, you know being in the mood of a servant as prataputra was doing when he was cleaning the road in front of lord lord jagannath so then just uh, about what you said that we you join krishna consciousness to be a part of the change to actually change because you had the faith that this is what is going to change the world at all if it is going to change you know i, re- I remember my my guru maharaj nath radhanath maharaj mentioned once to us that you know there are many devotees who who criticize the scorn criticize the scorn leaders they make websites about it and they feel that you know they uh, they were betrayed by some of the earlier spiritual masters who had some difficulties and fell away so what maharaj told us is that radha maharaj mentioned is that actually it is not just they who were who were betrayed even we were betrayed it is you know if you consider many most of the leaders today in our movement are are different from the leaders who were there in the first 10 years the first 15 years of our movement so he said that we chose to rebuild from within and those who are opening websites and criticizing all the leaders they went out and they're trying to in a sense destroy what prabhupad created with the hope of we'll create something else in the future so in a sense their intentions maybe they were everybody gets wounded in life and especially those are very big wounds if somebody whom we are spiritually trusted lets us down but what do we do about it so is it that uh, like like going back to Pra- prabhupada did not prabhupada did not go about say criticizing and trying to undermine or destroy the gaudiya math prabhupada focused on creating something positive and uh, so if a devotee is inspired if a devotee is connected with krishna internally and they feel inspired to do something they can do it so in a sense if i understand rightly the, the court is not condemning reformation per se the court of bhakti sanjog it is quoting mm-hmm. condemning the idea that i will be the reformer <laughs> isn't it yes so if i first connect with krishna and reform myself in the sense that i become well connected with krishna then maybe krishna will guide me how best i can contribute in the world to deal with various situations or very specific problems that are there and an indirect i think message i get from that quote what i'm about to say is a little unpalatable but it's i i think it's a obvious thing he's saying is that if i see that someone else as being the uh, cause of my problems in that then it means i haven't properly practiced krishna consciousness i haven't reformed myself and therefore i'm seeing all these other outside problems and things and and then these 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 people cause me this problem that is their fault and and that's the nature especially when when someone's been hurt you see in an animal an animal's been beaten or something like that then it it doesn't trust anyone And so that's our nature when we've been hurt we want to blame other people but we shouldn't be like animals we want to be vaishnavas we want to see oh krishna had his hand in this and and even those devotees those leaders in our society had their problems prabhupada also loved them and they also did a lot of amazing things for our krishna conscious movement in terms of distributing books and making buildings and they also created a lot of problems and did a lot of bad things but let's not only see the bad they also did a lot of good things too and krishna used them in some way there, there, i think we were mentioning before how i i heard this from jishu jumna yeah jishu jumna prabhu who was a sannyasi at the time prabhu's disciple he was in new york at the time of the rath yatra and there was there had been one big biggest kind of leader one of the biggest leaders at the time was a sannyasi who fell down with a woman and he went away and so just a jimmy was a sannyasi and he was asking shri prabhupad privately uh prabhupad how do we understand this and prabhupad told him a very very heavy thing prabhupad said actually 
none of you are qualified for sannyas. Now, let me make a little comment on that statement. First of all, I don't think that that, that meant carte blanche that all of Prabhupada's disciples that he gave sannyas to weren't qualified or all the, all the devotees in the future. But Prabhupada was saying it for a certain time and place. He said, actually, none of you are qualified. And he said, it's just like in, in the time of war, uh, when there's no leaders, then you make everyone stand in a line and you count every fifth person and you make them a lieutenant. He said, so in the same way I've been using the house. Like that. And, and, and someone may take that statement as, as a way to demean or belittle those devotees. I don't see it that way at all. I see that as the glory of those devotees. The Srila Prabhupada chose them and used them, and they became, to a greater or lesser extent, at, at a particular time at least, Prabhupada's instrument. And Prabhupada worked through them. And then maybe because there was some, as we say in, in uh, electricity, there was some resistance in the wire or something, then the electricity stopped coming, and there were some problems in our society and problems with that devotee. But still, let's see the good things about it. And, and why do I have to be obsessed with that? This is a society for Krishna consciousness. I want to become a Hare Krishna devotee. What am I supposed to do? How do I join? We were speaking about in our last couple of talks. How do I join? I join by becoming Krishna conscious. By focusing, and then Krishna will make it clear to me, Madhavananda, I want you to solve all the problems in this country <laughs> and make a website <laughs> or be a manager or make money or cook or do this thing or that thing. But I want to look for Krishna's voice. What does Krishna have to speak for me? But if we're not careful, if we're not purifying our heart, our heart and we're not putting bhakti in the front, then we may hear the voice of our mind. We may hear the voice of maya. And we may put on a good show. We may even convince other people that the voice of my mind is actually Krishna's voice. And people start following us. And that's, that's why I call such people little Putinists or little false gurus, even though they're the ones who are waving the banner of reform. They're presenting themselves as a big reformer. And ironically, they become the, the very disease they were trying to fight against, as, as uh, we were reading a statement from... Uh, 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 from Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley, yeah, okay. So, I just two thoughts I had in this um, when you mentioned this. First is that when uh, we are trying to solve any problem, now all of us, based on our particular psychophysical nature, our particular situation, so we get a particular perception of things and in our perception this may seem to be the most urgent problem and we may work to solve it say for example at one level the two of us are having this discussion and in a sense we are we may be felt a need to have uh, candid discussions on uh, often undiscussed issues and in that way we, maybe we are we are helping create a uh, culture of Guhyam Akhyati Prachyati. So there was something which we felt maybe is lacking. It is for our nourishment as well as for the other community nourishment, for the other devotees who are like-minded their nourishment. So, but when we are doing this, so it's not that we don't, uh, if we see a particular thing that is lacking and we want to, we do something to deal with it. So, this is something which we all need to do according to our vision, our inspiration, our uh, ability. But we don't think that like this is going, the lack of this is the cause of all problems. And this is going to solve all problems. To understand that maybe like going back to the earlier point of, you know, what, when does it become a conspiracy theory and when does it become like a focused contribution in a particular arena? So if I see that, uh, okay, there is a, there is a big problem and there is a, the problem is far bigger than me and the solution will also be far bigger than me. But if I can, okay, I can notice this part of the problem and I work to solve this part of the problem as an agent of Krishna in the mood of service to Krishna. And I respect others 
who are addressing other parts of the problems okay, krishna may act through me in this way and krishna can act through others in other ways so then if we see ourselves as like one small part of a bigger solution in which there may be many other parts and maybe other parts are much bigger than us then we won't have we won't succumb to that obsessive conspiracy theory kind of mentality at the same time we won't become just passive thinking that okay everything is in krishna's control why do i need to do anything at all if everybody has krishna's guidance krishna is in control then there is no need to do anything at all so we can avoid both those extremes that way any thoughts on this i like that very much I, you were speaking about guru makyati prachati and made me think that I, i thank you for that we should be creating a culture of guru makyati prachati which is a culture of trust but if we don't have faith in sadhu the shiva bhakti siddhanta says in one place that if we we don't see a sadhu present then we'll be forced to engage in blasphemous critical envious types of activities if we don't have faith that, that there's a sadhu present and then we're promoting a culture of distrust so i i i i we want to be a solution everyone wants to to we all want to save the world and that's why we're having this this uh talk today right because we want to save the world <laughs> we want to save our nation of course we all want to do that right but that comes krishna's teachings with the swami's teaching as guya makati prachati it it comes when we create a, a a culture of trust of intimacy but when there's a culture of distrust and 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 it becomes a verb that that we're we're actively distrusting people and we're promoting the idea you should distrust people and not have faith in anybody i i i when i was going to high school i i came from that kind of background it, it was like the hippie era and it was into the, the nixon era and things in america and i in high school i would sometimes ask raise my hand and ask the teacher to go to the bathroom and so he would let me go out and i would stand in the hall and wait for a few minutes and my friend who was in the same class after a few minutes would raise his hand and he would go to the bathroom putting it in quotes and then i would stand on his shoulders and we had these bumper stickers that i would stick on the wall in the school it said question authority and that that was our motto question authority there's nothing wrong with question authority we should question authority we should be independent thinkers that's important for bhakti but we don't want to create a society of distrust where we're, we're actively encouraging everybody just to not have faith in anyone that's a kind of atheism and it's 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 a horrible horrible thing to do to our society and this is what i think that that, that radnath maras is in is mentioned that There's some people who are basically trying to destroy what Prabhupada created. And of course, if you say that to them, they'll become offended. No, 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 we're not trying to de- destroy it at all. We're trying to destroy all the Putinists. And they say, but you've become Putin. As Huxley says, when we see evil all the time, we become obsessed with evil, then we become part of the problem. If we become obsessed, it becomes us. And, and we're no longer the solution. We're no longer the Hare Krishna movement. we become some other kind of thing i loved this phrase culture of distrust and it very precisely describes the the mentality of conspiracy theories eventually creates a culture of distrust rather than a culture of krishna consciousness and uh, that's uh, that would be something very counterproductive while there has to be we could like you said questioning authority pariprashnena there is a culture of questioning also but the overall attitude is more to learn and contribute not to like not to lampoon or destroy not to assassinate the character of anyone so if like you said we all want to save the world has a very christian and negative connotation but <laughs> we all want to play our part maybe say we can say making things better at whatever extent we can so if we so you know if i maybe i don't want to take your time beyond what we had planned but two three attributes i was trying to kind of summarize see one is that we need to have 
some amount of purity in terms of our connection with Krishna, then we need some amount of humility. That is not that I know everything and that I know the, all the problems and I can solve all the problems. <laughs> okay, I am a one small part of the problem, solution. And if Krishna wants me to play a bigger part, he will give me a bigger part. But if uh, there is this humility, purity and there is humility, and then maybe a third thing I thought of is some amount of maturity. Maturity in how we present ourselves. What would you say again? Humility? Purity, humility, and maturity. Purity, humility, maturity. I like that. So purity is our inner connection with Krishna. Humility is recognizing that I have a small part in the solution, not that I am the solution. And maturity in the sense that in implementing my solution, I don't end up creating disruption. I don't disturb other people's faith in things that may be working for them. So for some devotees, like we discuss about the individual and institution, for some devotees, say working within the institutional framework may work very well for them. Okay, this is my authority. I follow them and they grow nicely in their devotional life. So we don't want to disrupt what is working. But okay, but for some people, they need some more space. We try to create that space for them. So if we have these, then you know, we, can, we can make a tangible contribution without becoming obsessed with specific problems or without making, without fostering a culture of distrust. Any, any concluding thoughts, Prabhu, or anything you, you would like uh, to say? Yeah, just I, I, looking back on the, on the line of our discussion, Tatenu uh, Kampam and how we should uh, see everything is coming from Krishna and, and be Krishna's instrument. And just, I, I appreciate very much discussing with you and sharing your ideas and hearing from you. I, I want to be a vehicle for change. And I think we also, we want to encourage everybody to be a vehicle for change. As we were, we were mentioning earlier, John Lennon, I think he wrote it. So you say you want a revolution. Well, you know, we all want to change the world. I wasn't thinking of Christians <laughs> who would save the world, but we want to change the world. And everybody wants to do that. And it's the duty of this Christian, every member of the Christian conscious movement to be a vehicle for change. But change, we want to be a vehicle for, for positive change, not a vehicle for distrust. That's my humble thought. Walking away with. You know, there is uh, probably, because this is a big subject, and maybe for a future discussion, we could extend this point. But if you want to say one or two sentences right now, there is, we can say that we need to make inner change before we can actually bring about outer change. Or we should at least uh, try to connect ourselves with Krishna. But sometimes in that process, uh, like you should take responsibility yourself. But in that process, we can blame ourselves and we can beat ourselves down. And that can also demoralize us. And that can itself be a problem. So maybe because this is a big subject, we could discuss in a future session about, say, the difference between taking responsibility and blaming ourselves. We don't want to blame others. But if we've been in the name of blaming ourselves, we beat ourselves down. There is this infamous Catholic guilt, which makes people feel that they are, they are completely worthless and sinful and they're going to go to hell unless they get Jesus' intercessionary grace. So we don't want to constantly feel bad about ourselves also. So any, any quick thoughts on this? Or should we reserve this for a future discussion? Uh, sometimes we speak about Bishad Yoga, which is a big topic, but just to yeah. touch on it. In mean, the yoga of lamentation. Yeah. And there's three types of lamentation that we find in, in our philosophy. One is self-pity. And that's the uh, lamentation which Arjuna externally was exhibiting in the first chapter of the Gita. Oh, I can't. How can I kill them? It's going to ruin my life. They're part of my family. And I can't do that. And we start wallowing in self-pity. And then we can't do our responsibility. The second type of lamentation is what my grandma used to call atmakrandana, or the crying of the soul. And we realize our, our fallen position. And the third type of lamentation is transcendental. And we see, we hear the gopis crying in separation from Krishna and like that. All three are lamentation. 
but there's three very different types of lamentation. And I, I think this is kind of is under, underlying what you're saying. We have, many people have self-pity. And when we have self-pity, it's very destructive. Many people that they want to, they, they can't face what they are. And so they take to drugs or alcohol to forget about the fact that they're an abuser. They've abused women, they've, they've hurt other people. And so they, they can't face what they are and they're wallowing in self-pity. And they can't face their own responsibility. So we need to come to the point of Bishad Yoga, which Bishad means two things. Bishad means lamentation. But Bish means poison, Ad means to accept. It means the yoga of accepting poison, the poison of my fallen position. And that's the beginning then of, of Atma Krandana, or the crying of the soul. Oh, it's, I think it's beautiful. So three types of lamentation and I think this is a big subject, you know, we will discuss it in the future, but it's a very important point that, so when we are saying take inner change, that should not go into self-pity and I beat myself down, I feel sorry for myself, but it also means meant to make us connect with Krishna more enthusiastically, to call out to Krishna. Yes, true. So shall I try to summarize? I mean, it's a big discussion. I will see what I can do. So we discussed today broadly on the topic of it became almost like going beyond conspiracy theories. So we may blame people individually when we face problems, either our own problems or problems in the society around us. And when we expand that blaming mentality, we might blame some one particular agent, one particular cause, and that can become like a conspiracy theory. And so the problem with that is first of all, you know, we don't know enough to say that one particular thing is the cause of all problems. And it's more likely that the problem is more like ignorance or incompetence rather than malevolence. And even if it is that there is some one cause of all problems, so what are we going to do about it? That whether it is, uh, say somebody spreading biochemical, by doing biochemical warfare through pathogens or somebody trying to convert a whole country. How is it if we become more obsessed with evil, then focusing on godliness, then we will end up becoming agents of evil. As you quoted, I think it was Aldous Huxley. Yeah. So then you discussed, uh, you mentioned this point about the quote, two quotes of Bhaktisanth Thakur about reformation that criticizing others is actually very difficult work. And a guru has to do that. He said, I'm forced to do that. But why are you going out of your way to do that? So criticizing could also mean obsessing over the evil in other people. And that's why we might criticize. And that can bring out the evil within us. So the real problem with conspiracy theories is that we become more conscious of the problem than of Krishna as the solution. And then that can distract us from, from Krishna consciousness. And uh, Krishna consciousness uh, is, is the primary solution. And as a tool within that, there could be various things. You know, there could be some managerial change. There could be some change in power. There could be change. There could be bringing awareness of some problems, various things. But then there is a conspiracy theory mentality. Then the second thing that is a tool becomes the first, becomes the primary. And Krishna consciousness is like pushed, retired upstairs. And then, then we end up often being a part of the problem rather than the solution. And then, you're, so the world does need, in a sense, reformation is required, but to think that we are the reformers, that was a, that is a problem. And then you talk about how uh, we focus more on the domain of ideas. So at the transcendental level, we need to know that it is Krishna who is the solution. And if we are a part of the solution, it is because Krishna who is acting through us and we need to stay connected with Krishna. So there is more of a positive focus in trying to solve the problem rather than criticizing things like Prabhupada didn't criticize Gaudiya Math so much as he focused on creating an alternative in the form of the Krishna consciousness movement. And the problem with the conspiracy theories is that it creates a culture of distrust. And we can question authority, but it is more important that we find like-minded association 
So Varanashram is not so much about dividing people into society, but creating a like-minded association, having like-minded association where we all can make the contribution that we are meant to do. Like Arjuna fought, somebody writes, different people may do different things, but it needs to be in the uh, context of our connection with Krishna, our devotion to Krishna. And uh, you also gave the example of Gaurakishwad Babaji, how he didn't see the immediate that these people are beating me, but he saw that actually Krishna is throwing, Krishna is doing this to me. So we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that it is Krishna who is acting. And then I mentioned these three things that purity to stay. If you want to make a, we all want to make a change, contribute to change in the world. So purity to stay connected with ourselves, then humility to know that it's not that I have the full solution, but I am a small part of a bigger solution and I can see a small problem which I'll work on and then maturity in a way that we don't disrupt what is working, but focus on creating something which is constructive. And while working on this inside out change, taking responsibility, we can avoid uh, going into self pity, beating ourselves up by knowing that our focus has to connect with connect to become connected with Krishna, not on, not on beating ourselves down. Did I miss anything important Prabhu? Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, I was just thinking when we were speaking about all this, that uh, some of the biggest demons in, in conspiracy mongers, one of them was Kangsa. And he got together a whole gang of, of, of great demons. Well, what was the response even of, of the devotees, the, the members of the Yadu dynasty who were living in Mathura, who were great devotees? Jiva Goswami comments about a Kura and how someone asked him, look, what are you doing, man? You're working for Kangsa. I mean, <laughs> what are you doing? And Akura, Jiva Goswami says that Akura said, no, you don't understand. I want to be there when that day comes and he dies, and he's killed. I want to see that. But he has faith in Krishna. He's waiting for Krishna. And he's, he's so tolerant that even he's still working for Kangsa because of that he can't do anything else. Bhishmadev is another one who's working for Duryodhan, seemingly, but he's actually a devotee of Krishna. So sometimes devotees, that rather than seeing conspiracy theories and taking upon themselves a fighting, sometimes great devotees like Akura and Bhishmadev, even they seem like they're working for the wrong side, <laughs> but they're not. <laughs> yeah, you know, even now there are some Bengali. Bengal, even Bengali Vaishnavas, the Bengali nationalists, they, they still don't understand why Bhakti Nur Thakur stayed in the employ of the British government instead of countering the British government. So, of course, he was working inside out for change. And Bhakti Sanat Thakur also had quite friendly relationships with the British government. I think the Governor General came to, go to Mayapur. And so, in general, our tradition didn't focus so much on gaining political independence. So some people might say we were, we were cozying with the opposite side, the colonizing side. But actually, we were doing what our acharyas are doing, what is required for raising consciousness in that situation. So, yes, bro. Yeah, that was a superb point that I never thought of correlating Kamsa with uh, conspiracy theory. Kamsa was really, even when his wives would come, he was saying this is Krishna and Balaram. So that is... <laughs> So that is the extent of uh, obsession with that. Of course, he was being conscious of Krishna indirectly. But in that case, he was fearing Krishna. But we are not, when we get caught in conspiracy theories, we turn away from Krishna and start dreading something else. But you know, that is a beautiful example of correlation with Kamsa. So thank you very much, Prabhu, for your time and your association. You I look so forward to your association again in the near future. Okay, my, my friend, you please... Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you very much. I, you're a great inspiration for me. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's, you are a fount of such wisdom, maturity, and realization. And today's talk, I especially found that your consistent, con consistent emphasis on cultivating Krishna consciousness and not getting caught in something that was. You know, in the previous session, we talked about create practical room for yourself, for your creativity. But in today's session, you focus on that point that. You know, we don't think that any practical solution is the ultimate solution. You have to focus on Krishna consciousness as the ultimate solution. That is a, that is a wonderful point. Thank you.
ஹரே கிருஷ்ணா கிருஷ்ணா அந்த பேசுங்க